Hi, everybody. I'm Mary Beth Horsington, and I'd like to welcome you to the Strathmore Speaker Series. Thanks so much for stopping in here tonight for another informative program, the second event of our 2022 season. The Onondaga Free Library is partnering with us in this endeavor and providing the technical assistance we need to bring you this program. We thank them for their expertise and generosity. The Strathmore Speaker Series is made possible through the support of the City of Syracuse, the Gifford Foundation, the Greater Strathmore Neighborhood Association, and donations from people like you. We like to provide our speakers with an honorarium, so if you would like to support this, go to our website, strathmorespeakers.com, and you'll see a donation button on the landing page. Every dollar is greatly appreciated. Our guest speaker tonight is Lauren Edline, a nurse practitioner and herbalist from Baldwinsville, New York. Lauren is the founder of EarthStrong Center for Integrative Herbalism, which focuses on client care and community education. She is the lead instructor for the Syracuse Herbal Study Group, which promotes affordable and accessible learning, discussion, and topics in plant medicine to empower community health through knowledge and skill set building. Lauren also teaches at SUNY Upstate's Family Medicine Residency Program, where she works with interns to integrate herbal medicine into medical practice. In everything she, in everything she does, Lauren strives to achieve balance between the medical world and the traditional and traditional healing to help keep people informed, healthy, and safe. A question and answer session will follow Lauren's presentation, so be sure to stay with us. And now, please welcome Lauren Edlin. Headline. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Mary Beth, and thanks, Scott. I'm really excited to be here tonight and I'm talking about a topic that I don't usually get an opportunity to speak about. Um, usually, I'm teaching about these very concrete medical concepts or like the meat and potatoes of herbalism and talking about, you know, which plant you're going to use for lung health. And I don't get an opportunity to talk much about these abstract, bigger concepts affecting our healthcare system. And I was really excited that to be asked to come speak about this with everyone tonight. Um, and on that note, before I start sharing my screen, I just want to say that, you know, in that vein, tonight's lecture is going to be a little more on the abstract side. So we're not, this is not going to be a big presentation on, you know, how to integrate herbs into your life at home or what kind of exercise you should be doing. I'm really going to get into some of the conflicts that are going on in our medical system between kind of the modern medical world and what are seen as traditional healing methods. And I'm going to talk about why closing some of those gaps and, you know, kind of finding what I call healing at the crossroads is so important, not just kind of for the healing of our medical system, but also as consumers of healthcare, which most of us here are, including myself, um, ways for us to self-advocate to find ways to that middle ground that benefits out everyone. So I am going to share my screen. All right, be a little patient with me as I make sure I'm doing this properly. Okay, all right, hopefully everybody can see my PowerPoint here. Okay, great. Yep, that looks good. Okay, perfect. So um, I named this Healing at the Crossroads um, because I really, I feel, first of all, that's, that's where I sit. Um, my, I run two different practices. Um, I am a nurse practitioner at SUNY Upstate Medical University, and I, I manage my own patient load at our internal medicine practice in Fayetteville, New York. And then I also have herbal clients that I th see through my herbal business. And I do also use herbal medicine, preventative health, and nutrition strategies in my primary care world as well. And um, so I live very much in this crossroads where I'm, I'm meeting people at the intersection of a lot of different needs and a lot of different health preferences. And as I've done this over the past couple of years, what I've noticed is that um, I've noticed what people really need and want out of the different kinds of healthcare that they're seeking. And it's not always what we think it is. 
And I think that there is some room for education, not just of our healthcare providers, but as, like I said, as consumers of healthcare, to find ways to edge ourselves into those, those crossroad parts of medicine and really kind of redefine what we talk about when we're talking about integrative or holistic healing, which is what we're gonna be focusing on tonight. Okay, so we're gonna get started here. Okay. All right, so um, the, like I said, the purpose of tonight's talk, we're really gonna be talking about where this debate comes from and why there seems to be so much disagreement between modern medicine and more traditional healing methods about how to keep people as healthy as possible. I never used to talk about this that much um, when I was kind of living totally in one world or the other. I've been an herbalist for a lot longer than I've been a nurse practitioner. For a while, I was oscillating back and forth between two very separate frameworks that I was keeping separate. But as I've, you know, what I've noticed is they've come more together in my own life and in my own work is that that people are kind of going into healthcare thinking that everything is one or the other. And so I want to talk a little bit about why that is, where that disagreement comes from. And then we're all, of course, going to talk about what we can do about it as patients or as clients or as interested parties in what's going on in our healthcare system. And then I'm also going to talk about um, holistic and integrative medicine and what those words mean and what they don't mean. And we're going to spend a lot of our time kind of focusing on those concepts. I think most of us have very set ideas in our head of what we mean when we say holistic medicine or when we say integrative medicine. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break apart some of those definitions and challenge you guys to think differently about what those words really mean and um, how we can find that kind of care and find those kinds of practitioners and what we can expect from our practitioners if we want to find holistic or integrative care in our lives. So we're gonna redefine and reframe some of that narrative. And then I'm gonna end with some practical how-tos. Um, if you're interested in finding this kind of healthcare or um, learning more about what the options are and how you can kind of, like I said, live in those crossroads, I'm gonna give you, we're gonna go through some kind of practical how-tos about some ways that you can address with the various different kinds of practitioners that you might see. How to, how to work your way into that, that middle ground. Okay. Okay, so there's been this debate um, that's ongoing between traditional and modern healing that modern medicine, also called Western medicine, um, traditional medicine, um, just want to say for clarity, when I say traditional medicine, I'm not talking about our modern healthcare system. I'm using the word traditional to represent healing methods that are older and coming from traditional cultures. So, and in include a lot of healing methods that were around before modern medicine, our modern healthcare system. So that's how I'm gonna be using those terms. I'm always gonna say modern and traditional. So they're often seen as two very opposing viewpoints um, and that they're not just opposing, but that they're incompatible. So, you know, this idea that you can either be this holistic practitioner or seek holistic care, natural care, whatever you want to call it, or you can take a bunch of drugs and go to a primary care provider and utilize hospitals and you can choose to go that route, but that there's not a lot of middle ground. Um, and we have this idea that they're really incompatible with each other, that once you have decided to do things one way that there's not a lot of room in the debate to do things a different way. And I've seen this all the time um, in my professional life that you know there's a lot of providers that I consider colleagues that are not always open-minded to the traditional way of doing things or complementary medicine, holistic medicine, whatever you wanna call it. But I also see it in my other life too. So I also see herbalists or healers that I interact with um, in that part of my life also not having great things to say about modern medicine. 
But, you know, the disadvantage of all of this is that the, the patient, us, uh, the people who are consuming healthcare end up suffering. And that's what I think needs to change. So it puts consumers of healthcare in the position of having to choose one or the other. Um, this is not great because as I'm gonna share with you in a little while, a good, a good practitioner and truly, you know, genuine medical care keeps patients and clients at the center. And when we start to worry more about what the best way of doing things is, because this is the way we've always done it and this is the way it should be done, we forget that not everything um, is about choosing sides. It's about keeping the patient at the center of these decisions. So this segregates care strategies, leaving big gaps in knowledge sets between types of providers. So this is one of the other problems that comes with this kind of either or in healthcare, that it leaves these big knowledge gaps that the providers and practitioners of healthcare, whether it's a massage therapist or um, a homeopath or a physician or an osteopath or a chiropractor, it leaves it people are, get very specialized in one way of doing things, and then there's no room for knowledge of anything else. So that's another problem that I have seen and complaints that I've had from patients in my practice that they don't know where to go for people that know more about whatever they want to learn about, whatever approach to healthcare they want to explore. So when we make choices to do one thing completely one way or the other, um, we close our minds not just to different ways of doing things, but on education to kind of take that step and say, maybe I should learn more about this because it's going to benefit the people that I'm treating. And it also relies on outdated definitions of medicine, which um, I'm going to talk more about in the following slides as we talk more about what holistic medicine means and integrative medicine means. Okay. So just a little history on this, um, where all this came from. So, and I, I do talk about this a lot when I teach herbal energetics to my, um, to my herbal students. So I'm not gonna go into a lot on this. I could go on and on about the history of medicine forever, but just a little background on why these things have become so polarized. So our modern medical traditions, meaning that in American society, the medicine we practice, if we go all the way back to its oldest roots, we're talking Greece, India, China, and the Middle East. So Greece had a system that was based on the four humors. India has Ayurvedic medicine. China has five element theory and the Middle East has Unani Tib. These are all very traditional medical systems, all of which have somehow and in some ways influenced the rise of modern medicine just over thousands of years of it being developed and traded all around the world. The next thing that I want to draw attention to is as these things spread through Europe in the Middle Ages and before that, um, a lot of healing was done by um, by women in local communities. And this was what we call the wise woman tradition, which is now finding a huge renaissance in the natural healing community. You know, this whole, there's a very, very big emphasis on bringing back these wise woman traditions. But for a long time, hundreds of years ago, when kind of the granny healers of Europe were responsible for a lot of the healthcare people were getting, not only was there a lot of persecution that not only included things like witch trials, but on a much more subtle level as well, those traditions were stolen and actually put in the hands of a different kind of medicine. So a lot of that was lost for a long period of time. And at the time demonized a lot of traditional healing methods, which started um, kind of this very big fork in the road in our European American medical tradition, which was the polarization of community healing and medicine. This is where a lot of that came from initially. The medical part of it gave rise to a kind of medicine called physiomedicalism. Physiomedicalism was popularized in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries. And one of the biggest contributors to that in Northern Europe and in England was Nicholas Culpepper, who was responsible for 
a lot of the guidelines of usage of botanicals and plant medicine in what was then modern medicine. So this was still a time when plant medicine was dominating the scene in terms of what was available for usage for people. Because we're still talking back, you know, 15th through 17th century. So modern medicine was what we think of as modern medicine was still in its very baby stages. But I mention this now because those doctors, those physiomedicalist doctors were still taking a lot of things from traditional and community healing and kind of rebranding it as modern science. So again, we see this split. Modern science is going one way and traditional healing is going the other way and often being seen now as unacceptable or something that is not well researched, something that at the time was done by women and so lost a lot of its credibility once kind of the, the male dominated sciences started, started um, becoming more and more validated through the enlightenment. So, and that brings us to our next part of this debate, which was the dominance of science. So now we've got the, you know, we're a couple hundred years later, we're getting into the 1700s, 1800s, the industrial revolution is happening, the scientific enlightenment is happening, we've got Galileo and Newton starting to do all of these things in Europe with the sciences, and this is influencing medicine as well. So now we've got experimentation for one of the first times and research being done and we've got now reliable ways to measure evidence-based practice. They didn't call it that then, but what that means is that you are treating people based on scientific evidence, a hypothesis that needs to be proven with a conclusion that's based on experimentation and research. So once that began, now we're throwing out everything that doesn't fall into that mold, which a lot of the kinds of things that we find in the modern holistic movement um, doesn't fall into that, into those scientific strategies. And we're not gonna get into that tonight about whether or not that's acceptable or not, um, because that would be a very interesting but very different class about different ways to prove data and different ways to validate medical knowledge. Um, science has definitely become the dominant way of doing that. The modern holistic movement, which really started in the 1960s, 1970s, and now is having another heyday, has been kind of, as I mentioned before, to reclaim a lot of the things that have been lost over the past thousands, hundreds of years. So now we've got this dichotomy happening again, where a lot of those old things that were lost are coming back. And now we've got these two traditions that are facing off on each other. And a lot of it is based on this old, old history. And then the role of research, and I, I kind of hit on this already, but research has become the absolute focal point of validating medical knowledge. So um, again, not gonna get too much into this, but I will say that the work I do through um, my herbal practice and kind of modern American herbalism doesn't always fit the research role. So just keeping that in mind as we move forward that, you know, a lot of times research, research because it emphasizes evidence and data is one of the reasons why oftentimes doctors and um, other people who practice modern medicine only have a problem with a lot of the other ways of doing things. Again, that we're going to kind of leave that there for tonight but it is just, that is just something to think about, about where some of this debate came from. Okay, so, oops, I'm gonna figure out how to go back. I just messed up my slide. Okay, so what are the issues here? Um, a lot of this I already touched on, but one of the biggest things for the medical community is evidence-based practice. So, you know, acupuncture, aromatherapy, herbalism, homeopathy, there's really a huge lack of reliable reproducible data. We don't have it. I don't have it. Um, I don't have it. You know, the herbal, the practice of American herbalism is based on energetic systems that have been around for thousands of years before 
research and experiments and modern science were really around. And the things that I do for people work, but it doesn't work in this construct. So that's one of the big complaints in the modern medical world about why we should just get rid of all of this stuff. It doesn't fit into that re reliable, reproducible data. And it does lead to a lack of accountability. So there's no ability to say, this is what is going to happen when you take this. And it's great to have that accountability in medicine because we want to be able to rely on what we're giving a patient or a client. This is exactly what it's going to do. We've studied this in 20 different um, you know, double blind placebo studies and this is what we know is gonna happen. We don't have that kind of accountability uh, in the in the traditional or alternative medical world. And that's one of, again, one of the things that can be problematic for validating what we do in that realm. On the other side of this, we have we have medical reductionism. So what I hear from colleagues uh, in my kind of holistic world and my patients who come to me because they don't trust other providers is that they are sick of medical reductionism. Medical reductionism is the idea that you are reducing a person to a set of data on a page, a statistic, or that their organ systems are not connected and what's going on with their lungs has nothing to do with anything else and everything exists in a small, tiny little bubble. And this starts with research because when we are doing, when we are doing research, we need to be able to isolate variables to make sure that what we are testing actually can prove a cause and isn't just a correlation or a coincidence. But it does, because we're isolating variables, it limits the ability to see the person as a whole. This then goes into practice and it's difficult to continue to see that person as a whole when everything we do is based on bits of data that come from studies that are broken down into smaller pieces. So medical reductionism continues to be a problem for a lot of people when they're being treated by their physician or they're in the hospital or they're taking a medication because it can lead to this feeling that there's just this very narrow way of looking at things. And this makes it uh, its way into the medical guidelines too. So when we're when me as a provider is looking at the medical guidelines that I need to use to treat high blood pressure or cholesterol or diabetes or whatever the issue is, those guidelines are based on the ideal person and there's not a lot of wiggle room for seeing other things. It's just one number on a page. So I, I, there's more issues than just that, but those are the two things that I hear um, about kind of why these two types of looking at healing tend to square off against one another. Okay, so where does this leave patients? So in either clinical realm, this leaves patients in the position of having to take sides and choose one way of looking medicine, one way of looking at medicine over another. In this reality, patients are no longer at the center of their own care. Instead, this argument becomes the focal point. While some patients only want to hear about one day, one way of doing things, most patients want to hear about a wider range of options that puts their health as the priority, not just, well, this is the way that it's always been done and this is the way it should be done. So this is my little, I picked this because I, I thought this was funny, patient-centered care. So you've got like two doctors staring at their computer screens with the patients in the middle. So it's patient-centered and it's really corny, but I thought it was cute, so. So I want to advocate for some changes in terminology. So I want you guys to think about what comes to your minds when you think of holistic medicine, because we're going to try to solve this problem tonight a little bit. So I know when I think of holistic medicine, I'm thinking of yoga and massage and, you know, doing energy work and Reiki. I'm thinking about plant medicine and I'm thinking about eating right. So I'm thinking about all of these things that are basically just all these ways that we can heal ourselves and keep ourselves healthy that are outside the realm of what you're going to find in a doctor's office. It's kind of like the alternative health. So, and I, I think that's probably true for a lot of you that when you think of holistic health or holistic medicine, you're thinking about like all these alternative ways to be healthy. Um, 
So I just want to, I put this up here to kind of put some keywords, get your brains flowing about what you think now about when you hear the words holistic health or holistic medicine. Okay, and these are just, this was like a diet, a picture to go along with that. So this is like what I think of in my head when I'm thinking about holistic medicine. This is like the kind of picture that I'm thinking. We've got some plants. We got some plantain leaves over here. This looks like it could be cardamom. And we've got somebody made some pills with these things. Um, and there's always a mortar and pestle involved. So, okay. So, and then I want you to think about what comes to mind when you think of integrative medicine. Maybe it's the same thing. So maybe you're thinking about the exact same thing when you think of holistic medicine. In my mind, what I what I think when I get myself into the trap that we're gonna, I'm gonna try to free myself from tonight when I'm speaking with you guys, is that integrative medicine is basically mushing two different ways of practicing medicine or a couple different ways of practicing medicine together. So we've got, you know, in this picture, we've got this doctor in the middle, we got plants over here, we got pills over here, and then we've got the integrative doctor in the middle. So we've we're now just talking about taking a bunch of different ways to look at medicine and trying to basically like smush them into some kind of cohesive structure. That's what I think of when I think of integrative medicine. We're gonna talk about why that doesn't always work, but again, just to get your, your mind thinking about these, these concepts and these terminologies. Okay, so now we're gonna try to, oops, I have to stop pushing my mouse. So I want to redefine both of these things because I think that um, everybody ends up getting the short end of the stick when, when we're not thinking about these terms properly. So holistic care is care that incorporates the body, mind, and spirit while also taking into account different ways of caring for those aspects of the person in accordance with their preferences. Holistic care is truly patient-centered since treating the whole person requires a team approach with the person where they are in charge of their health decisions and the role of practitioner is to educate, support, and empower. And then my little diagram over here, holistic medicine focuses on the person. Instead of treating one condition or body system, it takes into account everything. So when we talk about patient-centered care, what we're really talking about is holistic medicine. And the beautiful thing about this is that you can be any kind of practitioner in the world or be seeking any kind of practitioner out there and they can still be holistic if they're looking at this whole picture. They don't have to know anything about exercise or yoga or herbs or nutrition. But if they are looking at you as a teammate and interacting with you on a level where you are being treated as a whole person, then that's holistic medicine. That's it. That's the entire definition. And I want to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit more in a bit about why that's important. Um, but for now, I just want you to redefine what that means when you're thinking about that concept. So this is what is not required to be holistic. You don't need to have knowledge of complementary or alternative medicine. You don't need a certain type of medical degree. And you don't need a full range of skills from a variety of health backgrounds. So this is more geared towards practitioners and providers, this slide. So I'm talking about the people that we see for our health, whatever kind of practitioner that might be. They don't need to be any of these things in order to be considered a holistic practitioner. Okay. So now I want to redefine the word integrate. So integrative medicine is traditionally seen as taking one or more approaches to medicine and smooshing them together. So this means a provider would need knowledge in more than one type of healthcare. And I gotta tell you, I've, I've been through six years of school to be a nurse practitioner and almost 10, five to 10 years of herbal apprenticeship. And I don't, I don't know, and I, that's only two ways of doing things. I don't know how I would ever, ever have time to do anything else. So having this expectation that integrative care is going to be completely comprehensive, it's really, really difficult for practitioners to be that good at a lot of different things. Sometimes I think that the best that integrative providers can do is be a little good at a lot of things. 
which I think can lead to some safety problems. So uh, that's basically what I have written down here. So it's difficult for practitioners to have large amounts of knowledge and numerous different types of care, um, i.e. all of these different sorts of things. And also we're just not trained that way. It's not where not only the medical system is, but when I got my herbal training, I didn't learn anything about interpreting x-rays or CT scans or lab work. So no one's training is comprehensive. And I think we have a lot of practitioners out there that end up doing more harm than good when they think that they are able to do everything under the sun together. So I want to undefine integrative as being something where your provider knows everything about everything. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk about changing that definition. So what sort of issues might this lead to? What are the advantages? I'm gonna talk about that. So the advantages of defining integrative care in that way, um, integrative practitioners uh, do usually offer root cause approaches to health, usually, not always. And integrative medicine shows more than one way to look at a problem, which is great. That's what we want. Um, most of us are just trying to be healthy and we just wanna know th what the options are to, to get to our health goals. Disadvantages of defining integrative medicine in this way, like I said, practitioners sometimes end up doing a lot of things a little bit well. And this, this, this leads to a lot of potential patient safety issues. And I bring this up in, because as someone who has intensely studied two ways of doing things, so I know an herbal way and I know a modern medical way, and there's a lot of nutrition thrown in the middle, and that's about it. That's where my knowledge stops. I can take you through nutritional changes, I can take you through modern medical interventions, and I can be your herbalist, but everything else I don't pretend to know much about. Um, and, but, you know, one of the problems is, you know, the safety issue that's inherent in not knowing our own limitations. And I apologize, my cat's about to walk, walk past the screen here. Um, but love not love knowing our own here. <laughs> not knowing our own limitations as providers, it puts patients at risk. It puts clients at risk. Um, we need to be able to say what we, what we don't know. And I have seen people who practice integrative medicine use a lot of herbs wrong and use a lot of nutritional interventions incorrectly. Um, so that's just something, again, that I'm mentioning here because I've seen it happen. So what should we expect from our practitioners, holistic, integrative, or otherwise? So I feel, and I'm putting this out there, that all practitioners, no matter what their background, should be prepared to do the following. They should be prepared to meet the person where they are in their journey. Sometimes for me, that's, I don't want to talk about anything except for medicines, and that's all I want to know about. And I'm like, great, that's fine. That's completely up to you. Um, but usually it's somewhere in between, and sometimes people don't want to talk about medicine that much at all. And we're going we're gonna to talk about safety issues with that as well in a little while here. But um, meeting someone where they're at, I one of the most valuable things I learned in nursing school, and I'm not sure they teach this in medical school, but I learned it when I was in nursing school, is the stage of change model. So this is a way to assess where someone is in their journey towards change. So I do this all the time with patients about weight loss, about, um, you know, exercise, nutrition, whatever the topic is, being able to say, okay, this is where you're at. And it's not my job to change where you're at in your journey. So that is holistic patient-centered thinking. Two, you should be able to create a patient-centered approach that emphasizes safety and empowerment. And you should be sorry, you should be prepared to take patient preferences seriously and know where to refer if knowledge is lacking. So this is true integrative medicine to me. Being able to know where to send people if you don't have that skill set. So if you're talking to your provider and you want a chiropractor or there's something going on where a chiropractor might be, help, might be helpful, the ability to say, yeah, I think this might benefit you. I don't know anything about it, but I can find out that's integrative medicine. So we don't all need to be experts in everything, but we do as providers need to be able to provide our patients or our clients with information on where to go to get that skill set. 
And that takes a lot of knowledge of what's going on in our communities and what resources are available um, and paying attention to different kinds of providers than, than those that do things exactly like we do. So what do we need to be prepared for as consumers of healthcare? So all patients and clients should be able to do the following. We should be able to self-advocate. We should be able to keep this stuff in mind and know that we have a right to be able to ask about different ways of doing things. And that just because somebody that we're seeing may not have a huge amount of knowledge in the way, in the questions that we're asking. One of the best things that I tell people in both of my practices is I don't know, but let's work on finding that out. So that is incredibly empowering for people, but I also rely on people to ask the questions and be able to recognize that what they have to say is valid. So don't be afraid to self-advocate with your practitioner. Two, ask for referrals when your practitioner doesn't have a certain skill set. You want to see a, a practitioner or you know, a provider of some kind that is different than the care that you're getting. Nobody should be taking that personally. So this happens in my practice all the time that I get asked that, you know, if, if you're not sure how to do this, Lauren, can you get me to someone who can? Yeah. And even if I'm not sure where to go, having, you know, expecting your practitioner to have a willingness to, to work with you on, on getting the knowledge that you need. And then three, have reasonable expectations for what a practitioner can and cannot do. So your herbalist is never going to know how to interpret your CT scan. And your primary care provider, with some exceptions, is not going to know if that dose of that obscure herb from India you've been taking for 10 years is the correct dose for you. So we, we can't expect our providers to know how to do everything. And in fact, expecting that from them, as I've mentioned, creates some safety hazards. Um, okay. So, and then I, I do want to talk about tips for creating bridges in your own healthcare. Um, these are these are things that have come up in my practice, and that's why I'm mentioning them, because there are things that either have come up, my patients have asked about them, or there are things I have done to make space. So these are ways that patients can make some space, uh, and that in between, and the way that I, as a practitioner, can make some space in that in between. I want to talk about medications. I have a lot of people that come to me and say, I want to get off all of my meds. So you're the, you're the integrated practitioner. Take me off all of my medications, please. I just want you to give me plants and I'm going to be completely fine. So that's not safe care. Um, and I definitely want to throw that out there. So what I have found is that when we're using medications, we're often using them to make sure that people are meeting guidelines, making sure that their A1C stays in a certain place if they have diabetes, or their blood pressure stays a certain, under a certain number if they have high blood pressure. Same goes with cholesterol, same goes with a lot of different medications that we use with people. Um, those medications, there's not a lot of wiggle room. I can't have my patient with a blood pressure of 170 over 100 having a stroke tomorrow because I took them off their blood pressure medication. That would be terrible. So a lot of times when we work with medications, when I'm working with people who want to find a way to do things in a way that's not driven by drugs, what we say is this is what needs to happen now to keep you safe and give us time to work on finding other ways to meet those goals and guidelines. So when we're talking about when it's safe to stop and when it's safe to wait, how I create that in-between space with people is saying, right now, you are not in a place where I can keep you safe and take you off your medications. Let's keep you on, do some work together, and then see if we can back off on something. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. Um, taking medication, taking people off their medications when it's not safe to do so is never something that any kind of practitioner should be doing. So I wrote down three different categories of medications where this comes up a lot in my practice. So it comes up with antibiotics a lot. Um, a lot of people want antibiotics all the time. A lot of people don't want antibiotics ever. So same with blood pressure, it comes up with blood pressure medications a lot. 
and cholesterol medications a lot. And I just wrote those three down because those te- seem to be the three types of medications where we have this conversation again and again about this is where patient safety needs to live. Outside of that, we can do some work, uh, but keeping you safe is the most important thing. So learning to look at medications differently sometimes in saying, okay, well, this is what I need to do in order to stay safe now, but how can I work with my practitioner? I'm looking at other ways to do things so that maybe this isn't the only thing that we're doing. Okay. So, and then, you know, the role of preventative health here. So diet, exercise, sleep, and stress are areas that can and should be covered by every single practitioner that's treating you for your overall health. You know, maybe your chiropractor isn't talking about what kind of omega-3s you're getting from the fish you're eating, but anyone that's seeing you for overall health should be addressing all of these things. You know, built into my new patient template when I first see someone is very specific questions about all of these areas. So, and they're all things that we're, we're all educated about. So every kind of health practitioner that's seeing you for overall health has been trained in these areas and they are really, really, really good opportunities to create that in between because you can ask your provider about them and you can say that you want to work on them and no one is ever, ever going to say, well, it's a terrible idea to manage your stress. You're just not going to get that answer for anyone. So, you know, hold your practitioners accountable and work in these preventative health spaces And don't be afraid to ask about them. And if they're not sure, ask for a referral to somebody that can help. Okay, so the role of diagnostics. This is for, this is my slide for the people seeing providers that are not medical professionals. So diagnostic tests include lab work, imaging, invasive studies and other procedures. So this is like my x-ray of the hand. Uh, While not every diagnostic is indicated for every person, your practitioner should be able to recognize when there is a need for them and get them to get you to the right people. So if you're working with an herbalist, if you're working with a homeopath, if you're working with a dietitian, someone that's treating you for your overall health, they should be trained to recognize not only when further testing from a medical professional is necessary, but when there might be a medical emergency. So when you're looking to choose someone who's truly holistic, remember that applies to our alternative health communities also. That definition of holistic care includes being able to keep you at the center, meaning that they're recognizing when they are not the safest person for you and that their knowledge could be limited as well. So don't be afraid to ask if testing for something is indicated for you. Okay. So finding practitioners that suit you. This is just a a little plug for some of the organizations that I really love. If you're more interested, if you're interested in finding practitioners that can help create these in-between spaces with you. Um, And if you're interested in finding out more about kind of the traditional definitions of holistic, meaning you'd like to explore some other options in your healthcare. Um, So I locally, I really love integrative practitioners in Willow Health, which are nurse practitioners and doctors in our Syracuse area who do this kind of work and do it well. So I consider them colleagues and they are the kinds of folks that are gonna help you get to the root cause of things, keep you safe, talk about a wide variety of things, but also say when, when they need to refer you to someone else. Those of you who are looking for mental health, I like the Psychology Today website. Um, it's really hard to get mental health referrals right now. And I think I'm throwing mental health in there because it's you know one form of healthcare we didn't really talk about much tonight. But I think it's important to recognize that that is another referral source if you're finding that you need more than what you're getting. And then if you're looking for an herbalist, the American Herbalist Guild has a comprehensive list of all herbalists practicing in the country who are registered herbalists with the American Herbalist Guild. There are also a lot of great herbalists out there that aren't. But if you're looking for someone reliable and you're not sure where to start, their website is a good place. Um, And then a few colleagues to recommend. Um, There's a lot of different places locally to look for this kind of help, but they're the yoga instructors, chiropractors. I work with some great ones over in my office 
And it can be hard to find these people. Um, so reaching out to providers that you trust, getting referrals from people who have seen people that they trust are all good places to start as well. So I'm just gonna end on my final slide. This is my favorite quote from Hippocrates and he's got a lot of really famous quotes out there, but it's before you heal someone, ask him if he's willing to give up the things that make him sick. So what this quote really means, you know, I know on the surface, it looks like we're saying that like, okay, well, if he doesn't want to be healed, we're just going to like let him go. Um, but what this means is that we're not dictating. So we're asking, is this something that you're ready to change that you want to change? And let's work together as a team. So a lot of times these simple questions that keep patients at the center of their own care and take our disagreements about how medicine should be done, it takes that out of it. What we're really doing is bringing it back to the patient and back to you and back to the client. So that's all I've got to share tonight. So I'm going to end it there. And um, thanks again for letting me come by and share my knowledge and looking forward to hearing more from everyone. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Hopefully, yes. Okay, we're back. <laughs> okay, so thanks, thank you, Lauren. And uh, so, if you have your questions, please type them into the chat. We've got two already. So the first question is from uh, Simone Montgomery, and she says, "What if a person does not look to the body for proof of healing? How about the metaphysical practitioner who deals with the relationship of mind and spirit?" So again. Um, there are definitely providers out there that are doing that kind of work. Unfortunately, that has not made its way into modern medicine much at all. But again, I, all I would say is that if you've got a desire to be treated in that way, and if that's something that you're looking for, then your provider, whoever you see, should be helping you seek out that kind of care because that's extremely valid. And, um, you know, I just want to throw out there that it's while it's not a knowledge that I have either, there are people that are doing that kind of work and, you know, you should be able to, to integrate that into the kind of care that you want to have. Okay, next question is from Patty Black and she has, do insurance companies make reimbursement difficult for these kinds of services? They can. Um, so there's a, there's a couple answers to that. So Insurance actually covers more than you think these days. So in a lot of insurance is covering chiropractics now, massage therapy, it's definitely covering integrative practitioners who are working in primary care. Um, it definitely does not cover what I do as an herbalist because technically we're not supposed to be practicing herbalism. I'm covered under my medical license, but not all herbalists are. So insurance coverage can be tricky. The other side, the other side of that is that insurance companies will only cover certain types of care that a medical provider will do based on meeting certain guidelines. So one of the things they do over at Willow Health, and there's a lot of other providers that are doing this, is that they will actually not take insurance at all and do um, a monthly membership, meaning you're paying a fee every month to be a part of their practice, but you never get charged anything else. And the rates in our area for that are actually about the same as a gym membership, actually a little bit less. So there are ways to financially work around if your provider is not taking insurance. A lot of providers are now finding ways to make the care that they provide more manageable for people financially. Um, I don't have a problem in my practice with insurance, but that's just because I work for a major medical university that takes all insurances. and. Um, that's obviously not the case with everyone. And one of the complaints I often have about holistic integrative care is that it's often unacceptable for people, which is why I honestly try to manage as much as I can in my medical office, as opposed to doing a lot of work in my herbal practice because I can take insurance. I can take insurance and I can still send you home with lavender tea all at the same time. So that's rare, and I know that not everyone has access to that, but yes, insurance coverage can be tricky, but it's, it is starting to get better. Okay, the next question is from Mary Beth, and she asks, I hear so often about the lack of mental health resources in the CMI area, and COVID seems to have just exacerbated this. Um, who can people turn to? 
Yeah, so um, I haven't been able to get people into psychiatry and counseling and I don't even know how long. Um, you know, so again, if you're looking for just counseling, I love the Psychiatry Today or the Psychology Today website because if you log on and you click in Syracuse, it's gonna give you every counselor and therapist in our area. It's gonna give you a bio, it's gonna give you a picture, it's gonna give you um, whether or not they're taking new clients, if they take insurance, it's gonna, it's a great resource. Um, also, primary care providers are trained to do mental health. So I think there's a difference in the scale of comfort level. I have worked really hard in my practice to do continuing education on mental health issues so that I don't have to rely on shipping people like out to psychiatry because there's just, there's no availability for that. So if you're on medications or needing someone who will prescribe medications, talking to your primary care provider is usually a good starting point. But yes, I agree. It can be very, very difficult in our area. Okay. The next question is from Deborah Merriweather. And she asks, uh, do you think drug manufacturers drive some healthcare? Drive some healthcare. I guess what uh, to what extent do you think practice is determined by what drug manufacturers have on the market and their relationships with practitioners? As I'm yeah, so one of the biggest problems with that, and this is a political issue that we could talk about for another whole couple of hours, is that oftentimes you find people who are taking part in private pharmaceutical companies also going back and forth between the private sector and sitting on boards that make up medical guidelines. So that's one of the biggest problems that I have with a lot of these things is that there's a lot of, just like we see, you know, you know, other politicians being influenced by the private sector. We have the same problem sometimes in healthcare that our, our guidelines are being a little bit sometimes driven by, by interests from private sources. Um, that's not always the case. A lot of times I just, I tell people, because I have a lot of patients and clients who like to do their own research. When you're reading research, always check and see who's paying for it. That's one of the biggest things that you can do to make sure that what you're doing is, is in what your providers are doing, staying honest. Um, because a lot, there is a lot of money in healthcare for sure. Yeah, I think probably also everyone's anxiety is driven by the fact that you see all those ads and uh, in a former life, when I worked on the film, in the film business, I worked on an ad for an asthma medication where one of the side effects was asthma induced death. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also probably, <laughs> we see also, all these on the market that have a million different side effects, yeah. but people are still prescribing them. Uh, for and I, you know, I, I spend a lot of my day talking people down from the side effect ledge a lot because yeah. most of the medicines that I prescribe to people are, are fine. Um, but we, those companies, there's so much science and so much, so many resources, so much money that's invested in that, that if they don't disclose every little tiny thing that came up in their clinical trials, they're opening themselves up for a lot of lawsuits. So some of that also just needs to be, you know, taken with a grain of salt a little bit, you know, the, the per because I, I love medications and I prescribe them all the time. Um, does it mean that every single person who I prescribe a new generation anti-diabetic medication to is gonna end up with necrosis of the groin? No, and I've never actually seen it happen, but like I do have to do a lot of ledge talking down with side effects with people. Um, the next question is from Ellen Vela. Uh, where could a person with chronic insomnia go for help? Oh, that's another thing I treat in my practice all of the time. <laughs> Um, you know, not to get into a big medical discussion about insomnia, but it's really about breaking down the root cause of that and, you know, start talking to your primary care provider about it. That's part of basic medicine. And if you're not getting the answers you need, there's other people that you can talk to. But one of the things that I do in my practice, when someone says they have chronic insomnia, which is probably every other patient that I see, um, is let's talk about where that's coming from and why it's happening. Because a lot of times the answers to those questions will determine where you need to go and what kind of care that you need. So again, I think a lot of it's just looking at what's going on and that root cause of your chronic insomnia. And those are questions that your provider should be asking. And if you're not comfortable talking about insomnia and sleep with your provider, 
um, then it, you know, looking to different kinds of practitioners can be helpful. Looking to someone who's gonna look at things from a, a more comprehensive patient-centered focus, whether it's, you know, that could be an herbalist, um, that could be a massage therapist, um, but looking at someone who's gonna understand those root causes. Yeah, I also feel like sleep has only recently become a topic for medical discussion. I talk about it. It's I, it takes up a, a lot of our visits. Um, okay, the next question is from Ann Kearney, and she asks: Are working with adaptogens part of a herbalist an herbalist practice? Uh, yes, um, I without getting into a whole tirade about adaptogens. Adaptogens are the newest buzzword of, of the herbal community. And they get stuck into like energy drinks and like chaga chai and coffee and like a lot of different things that are on the market right now. Adaptogens are the one family of herbs that can be really dangerous if taken by the wrong people. So I do a lot of work with adaptogens, but a lot of my work with adaptogens is taking people off their adaptogens. And adaptogens are also one of the categories of herbs that integrative practitioners that have a little bit of herbal training love to throw at people all the time. So I think a lot of herbal safety precautions actually live in the adaptogen realm. So they can be really helpful for the right people and really harmful for the wrong people. And again, that's another reason just to make sure that the person that you're seeing has a really good background in herbal medicine. Because yes, it is a part of what we do, but um, it tends to be a safety issue for, for people that have a, a little herbal knowledge. So the next question is from Martha, and she asks uh, broadly, why is mainstream medicine skeptical of what works? You know, if you take some remedy and it works for you and it seems to cure whatever is ailing you and you don't have any side effects that you notice or, uh, in, you know, impeding your ability to leave a, a fulfilling life, why? Um, What's the hesitancy there? No. Um, <laughs> I, I think sometimes it's just lack of understanding um, and not having a good explanation for things. Sometimes I don't have a good explanation for things either. And I'll have people come to me and say, like I had a patient come to me the other day who has, um, who struggles with, with jerking legs at night, which super common, it happens to a lot of people. It's not a huge pathology. It's just a nervous system twitch that happens to people at night. She told me that melatonin works for her. I've never heard that. I have never heard that melatonin gets people to stop having twitches as they fall asleep, but it worked for her. It's like, great, awesome. Maybe I'll start recommending that to people if we can't get anything else to work. So I don't know why there's a lot of hesitancy about that. There is this perception in a lot of modern medical communities that all herbs are harmful. I'm talking about herbs very specifically right now. Um, and that all supplements don't work. So supplements don't work, herbs are harmful. So again, that's part of the conversation that needs to be shifted and changed. I agree with you that a lot of times we're just kind of throwing things out when they don't need to be thrown out. And the same goes the other way. I have a lot of holistic practitioners that I work with who say that all patients need to be taken off of their medicine because all medicines are harmful and gonna kill you. So there's a lot of, I, I completely agree with you that there's a lot of misunderstandings that happen between from practitioners about what works and what doesn't. And we kind of need, we need to work on that. Cool. All right. Uh, and, oh, and then, so the next question is from Donna Norris. And can you uh, remind us again what the name of your group practice is? My medical practice is um, I work with SUNY Upstate Medical University. That's our internal medicine group. And I work at the, their Fayetteville office. So that's my medical hat. My herbal practice is Earth Strong Center for Integrative Herbalists or Herb Herbalism, which is located in Camillus. There we do, um, I see clients there. I also do a lot of community outreach and education, including, you know, we have a monthly study group 
that focuses on topics in plant medicine. And just, just a quick plug, our next one is coming up on the 22nd of February. And we're teaching on Zoom right now too because of COVID. And our topic this month is on aromatic herbs and how to, how to use them in, in health and practice. So we're gonna be talking about a certain category of herbs and then how to use them for certain, certain ailments. Cool. Uh, and then the last question is, I'm gonna rephrase it. Is there, are there any integrative practitioners that you would recommend? Yeah, so if you're looking for medical practitioners, kind of like I said, um, the two names that I love, um, and this isn't, so, you know, there's, there's me. <laughs> um, I, I am an integrative practitioner in primary care. And there's two other providers in the area that I really love. The advantages of them um, is that you can see both of these lovely women as consults only. So you don't need to leave your primary care provider in order to see them. With me, you need to leave your primary care provider in order to see me. Um, that is um, Carolyn McAuliffe, who runs Integrative Practitioners in downtown Syracuse. She's a nurse practitioner also, and she only does consults, which means you're going to go to her with a particular problem, and she's going to work you through that problem, and then she's going to release you. So, um, and she'll follow you for as long as you need to be followed, but she's not going to become your primary care provider. The other name um, is Susan Levinson, and she's an MD here in Syracuse. She runs Willow Health, and she used to work in primary care at Upstate, and she's my collaborator in the Family Medicine Residency Program when I teach there. She has a primary care practice, but she also does consults. So if you're looking for someone be, that you just want to speak to about a specific issue, but you don't want to lose your regular doctor, she can help you in that way as well. So those are my two, my, the two colleagues that I have um, that I love and I always recommend to people if you're looking for that kind of care. Great. Uh, so we do have time for one or two more questions if anybody has any um, while we're out there. Um, one question that came to mind while you were talking about the uh, whole, the, uh, while you're speaking was the idea of a, a team approach. And is that something too that would work, you know, because, uh, or is something that it seems like now, you know, you have a primary care physician and then you get farmed out to a specialist when you need it, but is there any uh, would there be any advantage if we shifted from you see an individual doctor to you get a team when you went there or is the medical yeah. system, the way the system works just now is not designed? Yeah, I think that if we lived in a different medical system, that would be the ideal way of doing things. Um, right now, I would just love all my patients to be able to pay for their medications. Um, you know, I, I think that that, that is always the goal. And you're never going to, I don't think you're ever going to find a provider that tells you that that's not a good idea. It's just how do we get there um, when there's still so many other problems and hurdles that we need to get past before we can, we can start bringing together that kind of care under one roof. There are definitely places in the country where that's available. Um, we, we don't have a lot of that here, but yes, like in a perfect world, we would have specialties all under one roof. And then you'd go down the hall and your chiropractor would be there and your mental health counselor would be there and your herbalist would be, and you'd be able to do all of this in one place. We just, we're not there yet, but I would love us to be. Okay. In my, in the ideal world. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, next question is from Nancy Walcott, and she asks, is holistic medicine more useful as a preventative medicine or a treatment medicine? I think it's useful for both. So, um, you know, again, if we're looking at holistic medicine as just kind of keeping all aspects of the person in mind, you can do that if you're you know, coming to someone to talk about the best diet to prevent diabetes and looking to get in shape and, you know, run on the treadmill and do all of these preventative health things. You can also do it in the hospital with someone that's on palliative care. So you're getting a wide range of this definition when you're thinking about holistic as keeping the entire person in mind instead of looking at it as one aspect of the person or more being more worried about, you know, whether your version of medicine as a practitioner is being respected. So, you know, again, holistic medicine can be practiced in any place at any time um, and at any stage on a person's health journey. Cool. 
Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Lauren. That was very informative and uh, hopefully very enlightening for all of our participants. Um, yeah, thank I am you so much for having me. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, okay, I am going to throw it back over to Mary Beth, who's going to tell you all about what we have coming up next month. Um, thank you very much, Lauren. That was a really great presentation. Our next presentation will be Thursday, March 10th at 7 p.m. when Holly Ann Grant will be our guest speaker. Mrs. Grant or Miss Grant is a conservationist and Cornell Lab of Ornithology project assistant for Project Feeder Watch and Nest Watch. She will focus on ways to make your backyard more wildlife friendly with feeders and nest boxes and offer tips for successful bird identification using the Merlin Bird ID app. She will also discuss ongoing citizen science projects at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. On April 14th, Alfonso Whitehurst will talk to us about finding the wisdom to overcome adversity and achieve success. He is a teacher, coach, and motivational speaker who works in the Syracuse City School District. You can find updates on our series at our website, strathmorespeakers.com. And thank you all for joining us tonight, and we hope to see you again in March. Bye-bye.